you want to make it playback by the police, for example, choose ABI, and then they can play it back on any VLC, Windows Media Player, pretty much any standard viewing software. Uh, it's a little thing that most people don't see it because it's quite grey on grey for that. But if I do, all right, so let's do this. Just with that, Ben, yep. I've had a couple of instances there where we've backed it up under ABI. Yeah. And in that police scenario, yeah. and even the client hasn't been able to play it on Windows. Okay. Mm. It's backed up the file. You yeah. can see the file there and how big the file is. But I've sure. What sort of so uh, do you know what sort of software they've used? A whole range of oh, different things? Just, they just use Windows on the laptop. I don't know what they use and they just couldn't open it up. Sure. Um, the police are a bit of an interesting case, and your end user a little bit too. Windows Media Player, the default thing that comes with Windows, that if you double click a file, plays AVI files, doesn't have codecs built into it for H.264, which is what this is recorded in. So it's a .AVI, but it's encoded in a particular framework, which is H.264. So you can think of it like me sending you a document that's in Spanish. The meaning is there, but unless you've got a Spanish to English translator, it doesn't make much sense to you. Um, Windows Media Player can download a codec for it, or you can install a pack to make it work. You can also download a free viewer like VLC, which is my favourite. VLC pretty much plays back everything. Um, VLC. Yeah, VLC is it's free. Uh, it's the Video LAN, what is it? Video LAN conversion or Video LAN something player. Essentially, it's the easiest one around to use and operate. Um, if you've ever been sent something dodgy over the internet, chances are you've probably had to download VLC to be able to play it. It's, yeah, it's well worth it. Um, other than that, you can patch all those other versions to do it. And your police station example is the other side of it. A lot of cases, uh, the police's networks and their computers are locked down for security reasons. So you can't install a bit of software or a firmware update or a patch or anything else like that on there. So uh, I know a lot of police stations that have a dedicated laptop for this stuff, and basically it's a, a white laptop. If something happens to it, if something goes wrong, you basically, they just wipe it clean and start all over again. Um, and that's the one they put dodgy software onto, that's the one they put freeware and things that they don't have to ask permission to do. So it might be worth asking a local police station if they do it, or if it's you, you can take your laptop in with the program and the viewer on there and off it works. Had a couple of cases with the older series DVRs where the ABI didn't encode properly the first time they did it as well. Um, for some reason, occasionally there's a corruption in the backup process, whether that's internally or transfer the USB. The file comes out, it looks okay, but it's corrupted and nothing plays it back. I'd always put a second copy of the same file on the disk. You just do it twice in a row if you have to, and then what, you've got one version that's going to work, or maybe both work versions are going to work. I haven't had that happen with any of the 960s or the NVRs yet, but I don't hear all the problems that come through, so potentially that may have happened with these ones as well. It's a tricky conversion thing that's being done all internally, so something could go wrong. Um, I'm not going to go through the backup now because it'll take a couple of minutes to do, um, but it is literally as simple as choosing your camera, the camera that you want at the top, choosing your start and finish time, and then choosing your device to back up to. I've only got one USB in, choose ABI, and I hit start and the thing goes. So, quite simple. Hi, Rick. All right. All right. Um, what I'm going to do now is actually switch over from this one to the other one, because the, the menu setup is almost identical between the two. So the new NVR working on IP versus the analog DVR, software setup on here is almost exactly the same. Same sort of login, same sort of user, user cases, channel setups, motion detection recording, and the rest are all the same between the two. So I'm just going to switch over to the other one, and then we'll give it a go on the next one. This one. All right, so this is the IP NVR. And I've got camera up the top there and the little one down the front running for it. And because I'm running a 900 line image on here and a projector that doesn't do the full 1080p, you're not getting the full benefit of 1080p vision on it. Um, it does look better than that when you put it up onto a big 1080p LCD or LED screen or a desktop monitor or something like that. Um, yeah. The cameras I'm using, 
This is a 50, um, 50 meter IR outdoor camera. And one little tip I'll give you for this one is it has a flip down panel at the bottom of it. Flip down panel allows you to adjust the IR, um, so your blackness level and your brightness level at night time. And you've also got in at the top here, you can't see it from there, but trust me on it, there are two little knurled screws here. They adjust the zoom and the focus on the lens for the camera. Little flip down panels protect my neoprene so it is weatherproof, and it's just got two little uh, torque screw drivers on the bottom of it. And you get a, oops, Allen key actually, you get Allen keys with the units to adjust them as you go. Uh, other than that, it's a pretty simple outdoor camera to work with, and the adjustments on the zoom and focus are actually pretty good. Um, you've got wide, wide dynamic range and all those sort of things in these, but there is no controller on this cable to set them up. You have to do it through the software, where I'll show you how to do that. Uh, the other things you should note, it has an analog output. So if you're up on pole with your analog wrist-mounted monitor, you can still work out what you're looking at. You can adjust the zoom and focus all from here. You've got a local power input as well. So you don't have to power this thing by power over Ethernet, which I'll talk about. You can power it up locally. That way your monitor can test it, set it up, do everything else, then you run your data cable back inside and off you go. So very, very convenient. The other camera that I've got there is one of the indoor domes. Well, actually it could be an outdoor dome as well, this one. Jump around this side. So, on. Same sort of thing, BNC out as well as an RCA out. Uh, by the way, that is simultaneous with the PoE and Ethernet out. So you could take this out and plug it into a TV screen. So let's say you had a shop front, you had a camera on the front door or something like that one, or on the showroom, you can plug this into a modulator or directly into a TV and have a video output so that you can monitor what's going on in the store and then have your recording back up to the NVR out the back somewhere as well. So it's a nifty little feature that might be good for some of your customers. Um, all right, so camera itself. Uh, yep, infrared, light sensor, neoprene rubber, screws on the top to adjust it, and this full body inside here moves around and in all directions. Keep in mind, it's got tiny little cables in there. If you turn it too far or you're a bit heavy handed on it, you will damage it and rip something out there. Please don't do that. Uh, and the other thing is, it also has adjustments. So under the top of this, if I can get this flipped up while it's in my hand. There we go. Again, you've got two little knurled screws in there that allow you to adjust your zoom and your focus controls for it too. None of that is done through the software, that's all hardware. That's pure, get your screwdriver and your hands out and adjust them as you go. Alright, but very, very simple camera to work with. Good system and built well on the inside as well. I invite you to come up and have a bit of a look at it later as well. Alright, so let's put them back. Nice job. And just with the POE, uh, I know yeah. in Ubiquity we've had lots of cases where the, the router, the switches or routers are not able to supply enough power. Sure. Um, and we sort of say, yeah, let's use the plug packs. Would you say default use of plug pack is a recommendation or is it not such an issue? Well, Mike brings up a good point. Um, I haven't mentioned PoE except in passing. So PoE is power over Ethernet. So the idea for this camera is, through one data cable, I'm supplying all the video and data information I want, as well as power to the camera. So that fires up the infrareds at night. That allows me to software set up and do all those other things all over that one cable. But for that to happen, this thing needs to inject the power somewhere. So on this unit, it's got a four-port PoE hub on the back of it. It's like a, a standard network switch. You know, you plug four devices in, you can talk to four devices. But this one also supplies the power. The hours are designed to run enough uh, power to power these cameras up. Um, they're the right voltage, enough current to do it. If you buy another PoE camera from somebody else and want to get it running with this one, first thing I would check is the PoE requirements and see if this is going to be powerful enough to do it. Um, what Mike's also mentioning is PoE is not exactly, there are PoE standards, but they are a little bit broad. So there are different voltages and different wattages depending on the devices that you're using and where you've got your gear from. 
So let's say the Ubiquiti TSA Pro has got 150 watts worth of total power across all eight ports, and it's, I think, up to 48 volts per output on there. Um, these cameras don't need anywhere near 48 volts, so they will request a much lower power level. 150 watts for eight cameras, you know, that's more than enough. You know, heaps, heaps. But a big PTZ camera may use four amps worth of current at you know, 24 volts, and that might not be enough to do it. So um, you need to be a little bit careful about your PRE requirements. Check your total wattage, and check what voltages and currents each port can supply when you're using it. Um, for a basic system like this, we've designed them to match. So PoE cameras from us, plus PoE DVR or NVR from us will match and will work, and it'll be enough power to drive it. It does mean you have two power supplies for this NVR. There's one power supply for the uh, NVR, sorry, for the NVR side, and there's another power supply for the PoE side. Uh, we could have done that with onboard ones with the 240 volt straight plug in and the rest, but it adds a single point of failure to a system, and it's generally a bad idea to do that. If you can have a separate plug pack that can be replaced, whether it's a 12 volt one on this side, a 48 volt one on that side, it's a much quicker fix plug replace, and off you go again. If something died on the board inside here, it means coming back to our techs here, replacing it with a new board, replacing service mount components, or whatever it is. This way, if it's just a couple of power supplies, they're the most common things that can fail. Plug a new one in and off you go again, which is good as new. Um, did that cover everyone see that one? Cool. All right, so this is the NVR. Now, I'm just going to jump into the settings for this one, and you'll notice the menu looks pretty much the same as the other one here. Um, I can put this in 4x3 mode, which will actually help this projector, but I'm not going to do it for today. Um, login, same thing, no, no password. Uh, the automatic user guide sets up, comes up every time unless you tell it not to. You can actually select your resolution here. So if you're having any particular problems with it, you can adjust that on the fly. And the video format PAL, I can't imagine why you want to use NTSC here, but if you have to, it's in there as well. The network setting is in here is what it's currently set to. It's not necessarily what its default IP setting is. And I'm going to get into the network stuff because it's important, but for here, I've got my default gateway, this thing, my modem, or my router, is 192.168.0.1, and you can see my top IP for this thing is 192.168.0.238. The first three are exactly the same, the last one is the only different one for these. If you want to play with stuff on a basic network, that's what you've got to start from. You need to be able on the same subnet, the same thing, and I'll get into network stuff in a little bit, so. Bear with me for just jumping past it quickly, but this is the way you can set it up fast if you know what your network settings are to start with. Set this in here, hit OK, and now I can get into my the rest of my menus if I was fast enough. Let's try it again. There we go. So, same thing, playback. That looks remarkably similar, doesn't it? If I go into today's, I choose camera one. There are my motion detection sections here while we had a yawning Tim wandering around the back after a long drive in from Warrnambool. Thank you, Tim. And we've got the sections where we've got people starting to talk here, and this is probably me wandering around playing with cameras, so there we go. You can see, if I try to select a second camera, I can't do it here. This is what we are talking about before. It'll only play back one camera at once. Turn that off and go to camera two, stop. Now I can go in here, and you'll notice I haven't got any motion detection and stuff, so it's not going to pick up the same thing as from right now. Anyway, so that's playback, same thing as it was before. Backup is exactly the same as it was before. ABI, choose which channel, choose what time and start, choose your USB drive, and you're good to go. Pretty simple. Uh, let's jump into... Actually, let's do one... Yes, let's do these settings first, then I'll get back to the IP camera setting. So, here's a basic page. Uh, we record replace. People ask what happens with the recordings once you reach the end of the hard drive. Record replace says once it's finished and full, it starts up and start again and wipes back over the start. So think of it like an old VCR tape. You get to the end of the VCR tape, go back to the start, and record from the start on again. You can change that if you want it to stop at the end of the hard drive. Can't imagine why you use that normally, but it's there in case you do. 
Uh, RS485 for PTZ control is in there, and there's a QR code which will go into the apps, which I'll show you in a little bit. Protocol stuff here, this is different from the other one. These are all the output IP formats that it does. So on VIF profile S, i8 format, i9 format, and RTSP are all in this device. Probably doesn't mean a lot to you unless you've done a lot of IP camera stuff. Um, the short answer is our cameras work really well with our NVR. Some other cameras may work well with our NVR. Some of our cameras may work well with other NVRs, but it's a matter of these settings, resolutions, and formats that you actually change for them. And that I will try to talk about in a little bit as well. You can modify your time and dates at the bottom here. And yes, standard stuff. Right, channel details. My four channels, I can change my camera name in here by clicking on the keyboard. I've got an actual camera name here because the camera that it is. I can change my, where I put my stuff on the screen as well. So if I want that down the bottom left hand corner or something else, I can do all of that in there. Okay to exit. Uh, there are some image settings in there in terms of contrast and so on. Generally speaking, you shouldn't have to play with it, but it's there. Right. Again, this is all pretty standard stuff. Let's move over to recording. So, the two ways that most people record are schedule recordings and motion detection recordings. Schedule is, it just runs the entire time you tell it to. So it could be from 8 o'clock in the morning till 5 o'clock in the afternoon, it just records. At night time it does nothing. Or, you can do motion detection, which is, while it's on, if it detects enough motion going through, then it sets up the recording and it does its job. The other way to do it is you can put the two together. So you can have part schedule, part motion, depending on the time of day, day of the week, and all those sorts of things to get it working. Um, so the things to know are, this is only per channel. So you have to set this up for every different channel that you want to do it for. You can copy these settings from one to the second, to the third, to the fourth, and so on. But when you're setting it up, it is only for one camera. You also have not changed anything until you hit the save button in the top right hand corner. If you decide to choose to another, go over to here and you change something, it will be exactly the way it was when you go back. You will not change until you save it, so just remember that. So I've got enable recording, all day recording on motion here. In my advanced menu I can do a pre-record and post-record time, so that's a buffer at the start and at the finish. So, you know, it could be an area where there's uh, you know, somebody running through fast, and because they come into frame fast, by the time the motion detection starts the recording, they might already be a couple of frames into the screen or might be a little bit in. If you set up a pre record, then it runs a sort of buffer all the time so that it's got five or ten seconds worth of pre record time until the motion actually officially starts. So you get a little bit extra padding on either end for it. It's a useful thing to do. Um, and post recording as well, same feature just on the other end. Now, and that's part of the motion detection recording, that's not all of it. You also have to go to motion here. You need to enable the motion detection. That little box there, I wish the tick marks were in a different colour, but they're not yet. Um, if that's not enabled, then you can't select any of these settings, so it's quite easy to know whether it is. And again, we're only doing this for channel 1. I go into my area settings now. Because I've already done this, the whole screen is set up, but let's just wipe that clean. So, at the moment, it is not motion detection, detecting any part of this screen whatsoever. So motion detection is set, enabled, all those other things, but it's still not doing anything because it doesn't know what it's supposed to be looking at. If I was only concerned about these unscrupulous chaps in the back row, I can select that area and only if you guys move does the motion detection set off. Or, I can set, click and drag the entire frame. Left click to select something, right click and drag to deselect something. It's pretty simple. We try to make it you know, relatively easy to work with, but just in case. Can you play that out? Not through this screen you can. So that's the area settings on there. My sensitivity, okay. I only ever use it at this level. I think these things are actually just a little bit too sensitive for I'm good. So setting this in here means that the majority of the motion is going to be set off. You're going to see the majority of what you want to do. In fact, all of it probably. You'll get triggered events that are really, really minor things like trees flapping in the background or flags waving or whatever it might be. 
when you start getting up to these sort of sensitivity levels, okay, so have a look at around the edge of these lights there. There's sort of a bleed out effect because of the way that this is working, but there is clearly none in there in real life. This sensitivity up there is high enough that it detects those pixel movements at the edge of lighting or the edges of sharp objects as motion. In other words, you're going to get permanent motion going off this thing. So I don't ever use that, I tend to use it down at this level instead. Maybe one more if you really have to. Um, it's something I've asked our factory to sort of look at changing around a little bit for the next firmware update and see how we go. Alright, so we've now got an ARM schedule. This should be set by default to 24 hours a day. Um, you, know, you can go in here and change this if you need to just by clicking and dragging the areas or you can go into settings and actually change it by the numbers as well. So it's incredibly capable. This is just for Monday and I can go through and choose any other day or I can copy it across to them as well. We try to make it easy but as capable as possible. And the last thing, the thing that probably 95% of my questions about motion detection come down to is this bit, the linkage. It doesn't sound like it means anything, but it is incredibly important because without it set, you're still not recording anything. So you've done all the rest of those motion detection. You've told it when to look for, you've told it where to look for. You haven't told it what to do when it actually detects motion. Because you could use the motion to trigger an email. You could use it to trigger an audio warning. You could trigger an alarm output to set off a strobe or a light or an external alarm or something else like that. But what we want to do is we want to trigger recording. So at the bottom there, we've got channel one, ticked, and OK. I save that now, save successfully. My camera one is on motion detection 24 hours a day. When it detects motion anywhere on that screen, it starts recording on channel one. I could use channel one to motion detect for camera two to start recording. No idea why, but you might want that. It's just that capability is built in, but you need to know about it, otherwise you get the setup wrong and it will not work. So don't forget the linkage. It looks unimportant, but that trigger recording under linkage is the thing that stuffs most people up when it comes to motion detection. So be very, very careful there. Any questions on that bit? Does that make sense? Anybody see any good examples why you might, might want to trigger other recordings when motion detection goes off on your primary channel? Yeah? Well, shop, for instance, you might have a camera on my door, um, and the well, was just rinsing the so at least they can trigger it so that when the guy's running into it, you can pick everything. Yeah, exactly. You can really be doing the job. Exactly. You can't have to get motion for some reason. Exactly. It's too dark for it. If you Theoretically, if all the cameras are set up pro properly in motion detection, then they should be able to see the motion whenever whichever camera is triggered and then do its own recording if you set it up this way. But as Damien said, if something happens with one of the other ones, like there's an overload of lighting or there's too much motion in the frame already or something else is happening there that it's not expecting, at least this thing will trigger it to start recording from the first camera anyway. So it might be useful depending on the environment you're running with. Cool. Um, Alright, so you must, uh, video lost is if somebody covers over, the, or the camera um, gets covered over. Tampering alarm is if somebody essentially moves the camera around or does something else with it that seems unexpected. It, it's basically motion detection on a large scale. You know, if somebody, if I start moving this thing around here, I'm moving every single pixel in the image at once, and that's unusual enough that it detects as that. Again, it's fairly unusual, but you can use it there as well. And there's also a video masking setting, which is what you were asking before about. You can enable a video mask. So let's say uh, I don't really care, I don't want to see what's going on in that section there. I highlight and do that, and then on the recordings, that section then becomes blacked out. And so that could be over your neighbor's fence, that could be your neighbor's business, could be your you know, public footpath or street or something like that. Does that, does that take it off the frame? Off the recording mode only. The on the no, it doesn't. No, it only takes it off the recording itself. So if I jump out here, let me save that. Let's see. Actually, no. The update has changed it. There you go. Beautiful. Sorry, there has been an update that did do that. So this is the one that I've just set, and now that whole area is masked. So, good question, thank you for yeah, It doesn't do it on, on playback. I'm sorry, I'm not using it. This is yeah, we're viewing it live. Yeah, so yeah. it does actually yeah. change. Yeah, yeah, that's right.
I've got customers where they want to walk out there, chill, and yeah. stuff like that. So that or changing, room, changing rooms and yeah. so on as well. Yeah, definitely. No, that's that's good. That was a firmware update that I forgot to put on here to, to change that. So, yeah, good question. Um, let's just... The other question I was going to ask too, do the uh, cameras themselves, do they actually allow uh, HD or SD card? No. No, these don't have uh, micro SD cards or anything like that on them yet. It's something the factory might be able to do for a next generation of them. We're only, we've only got, I think, eight or nine different IP cameras in our range so far, but we've got options from the factory for a lot more. So some of them will have micro SDs and other things on board for the yeah, quite handy. What do you use it for? Yeah. Well, it's that. mainly for backup because of the simple reason people come in and they'll go and knock off the DVR or the NVR. Sure. And you've got it on the cameras. A local backup there, yeah. You just pull it car out, plug it, and get it on the I've also seen it used in places where you get lots of network overload too, and so you end up with a buffer on the camera itself, so it can't transfer all the video down that it wants, so it keeps a little bit behind and then sends it when the network's less busy. It can be a good thing to do. Is it better off to set up a different network? Different subnet? Yeah. 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 yeah, it can be. Um, I'll move into networking now, I think. That way we can do a bit more about that stuff and the apps and so on for it as well, and I'll talk a little bit about the subnet stuff as well. Um, the first IP camera that we had had um, SD card capability. Yeah. So. We've still got a couple of those. Uh, PT10 PT range, yeah, they've got a micro SD card on them, but they're more of a standalone device than they are part of an integrated system. So set one up in the garage you know, with a little micro SD. You can view it on your mobile phones, wirelessly pan to zoom, and things like that on it. But it's more of a uh, step up from entry level camera or standalone. Um, one last thing, I wanted to show you the, oh, two things actually, hard drive settings in here. If you're ever worried about whether the thing's recording or doing its job right, go into system hard drive setting and you can see there, there's my capacity, it's one terabyte drive, and I've got free space about 300 gig, which means I've been recording for 700 gig on this. Keep in mind, this is a 1080p recording, I've got two cameras going, they weren't on last night, they are on for about two hours yesterday and about two hours this morning, and we've used up about... 600 gig worth of space. 1080p recording uses a lot of hard drive space. Um, I've only got one terabyte in here. The minimum I recommend for these is three terabytes. Um, four terabyte is great. Multiple three terabyte drives, fantastic. But so the, yeah, the purple drives are very much. Purple one's another option too. Um, it's a how many drives? Two. Um, there are different classes of hard drives. Uh, from Western Digital, who's our primary supplier, green, blue, black, red, purple, red pro, there's all these different versions of them. The ones that you primarily use for CCTV systems are green as an entry level eco drive, which is what I'm running here now, or purple. Purple are a surveillance drive. They're designed for surveillance use. They're designed to take as much data in as possible and their upload or output speed is low. So, you know, imagine a normal hard drive at a computer. You want your read and write to be fairly, you know, much the same. You know, you want to be able to write stuff to the hard drive, read it from the hard drive, same speed. CCTV system, you're going to be dumping more data to it, generally speaking, than you're going to be pulling data off it. So they optimize the software and the hardware to do that. They also optimize the build of the drive so that it survives better in 24 hour a day usage with vibration in multi-unit chassis and all sorts of stuff like that. So using a purple drive for surveillance is easy. It's the equation, this goes with that, that Suzanne, or whatever it is. That's the idea. You need to put those two together. Um, green drives, if you've got a customer who's particularly cost uh, prohibitive, um, you can get away with a green drive, but they're not expected to last as long and they won't work quite as well in an IP situation. Um, you can end up with more errors, more failures over a longer time. So use a purple class drive whenever you can. Specking into your quotes, specking into your jobs, it's very, very important. Um, there's an update feature through here from a USB stick if you ever need to do it, but the last one was the account. Um, this is something most people don't actually play with. They leave the admin account in there, they leave a blank password, and they don't ever touch it again. That's great for our techs. It means they don't have to get it back when people forget their hard drive, when they forget their password. We just tell them not to pull one in, and then they log in, and everything's fine. 
It's not great for security though. Uh, it is worth it to set a password for your customers. And there are two ways, or two things I'd recommend doing for it. Number one, I would lock the admin account with a good general password that you keep a hard copy of for your password on it. It's very, very useful. And for every day use, I set up a guest account that has a certain amount of permissions. And the idea being that they can't screw up all the settings, only the ones that you let them play with. Um, it's, I hate to use this analogy, but it's like my parents and Windows. Um, Windows on their computer, I, I allowed them to have admin account access for all of about six weeks, and they managed to essentially delete half the system files. So since then, I've set up a guest account for them that essentially means they can do most of what they want to do, but they want to try and install that program that came in looking like it came from an Nigerian prince, they can't do it. So that's what I've done for there, and it makes sense here as well. So if I set up this guest account here, I can adjust what I allow them to do. So I've given them local backup and local playback, but I haven't given them PTZ control. I haven't given them upgrade or format. So they, your standard everyday user can't get in there and format the hard drive and whiteboard the stuff that's off it. They can view uh, some of the remote playback and backup settings and stuff like that, but it's up to you which settings you want to set for them as their everyday account. And that's a really useful thing if you've got a user who you think may possibly at some point give you problems or you don't want to get that service call at 2 o'clock in the morning when somebody's wiped the hard drive or whatever else might come out of it. Unless your service call fees are huge, in which case, go for it. I don't mind at all. Um, but it's a useful thing to do, just to set up that everyday account. This one I've set up with just a 123, 123 password. They log in via that. They see most of what they want to do. So if I get out of this, and then log out of my admin account, now try to log in with my 123 account. Yes. I can playback, backup and capture. If I get into the settings here, uh, no. They can't, change, they can't change the settings for recording times, motion detection or any of those other things. It's a useful thing to do that not many people take advantage of. So just remember that might be good for you as well. Let's lock him out. Log back into the admin account. Yes. All right. So, one last thing on this front menu that is different from the analog ones, and that is the IP channel settings. So, IP cameras, data cable into the back of this thing. Great. No problem. You think analog DVRs? That's the way it works. You don't have to set anything up. You don't have to play with anything else. You just plug them in and off they go. IP is not the same. These things, by default, uh, so you can see it on this one has a default IP address written on the side here. It has a default username and password on the side here as well. If I left this thing at its default IP address, this DVR or NVR would not see it because it doesn't know that it exists. All right, Just let that one sink in for a second. This needs to know that this camera exists and by default it doesn't know that it's there. So that's something that's very different when you're setting up an NVR from any of the traditional ones. Now with this IP address, I can type that into my Internet Explorer browser and get into the camera and change its settings and play around with it. I can manually do all of that stuff and I'll show you exactly how to do that in a minute. Or I can go into my settings on here, log in, log in, actually I need to make So if I go to IP channel settings here, I can do all of these things. Now, there's four ports in the back and they're numbered. It makes no difference whatsoever what port number you plug your camera into. Zero difference. I can change that sequence by dragging the cameras around the screen anytime I want to. I can also do a manual channel setting for, so I'm selected on this one at the moment because the red bar around the outside. I can change that manually to be you know, another camera that I've just plugged in the back. So I could put 192.168.1.88 or whatever it is that's on there. Or I can do an automatic search. And then it goes through and finds all the IPC labeled cameras that are on the network and then sets them to port number, or sorry, sets them to IP addresses that it can deal with that are on its subnet that knows what's going on. Um, remember at the start I said it was 192.168.0.238 set to? Well, 
This one's set to 192.168.0.239, and this one's set to 192.168.0.240. That tends to be the way it does it. It tries to sequentially add them all in from its own IP address. And by doing that auto setup, uh, doesn't mean much here because I've already done it, but there we go. Our cameras would appear on the screen if you couldn't see them already. So that's a neat thing to do. Now that won't land anything on the same network if you've got yeah, uh, other IPs uh, that network. What's that, sorry? If you've got a heap of other IPs sure. in that network, it won't click one of those cameras to that same it can. address. It can. Have trouble or? Yeah, definitely. Um, this. This is where it starts getting more complicated into the networking side of things. Forgive me, I'm not a networking guru or expert or the rest of it, because quite frankly, if I was, I'd be earning several zero figures at the end of my salary more, and you know, that's... I know those people, they're very happy people. Um, the thing that I would say is, networking is, yeah, is something I dabble at, and I'll try to give you my best overview of it, including some analogies that make it make sense to me now, but they may not be the most accurate way to look at it from here. What Tim is saying is absolutely correct, um, but I need to talk about the basics of the network first. So I've got this thing here. This is my router. It allows me to plug in four hardwired devices in the back, and it's got 2.4 and 5 gig wireless networks connected to it as well. So anything that connects through to this via 2.4, 5 gig wireless or directly wired into it needs to have an internal IP address, otherwise it will not work. Um, think of it like desks in a, an open office. You've got a whole raft of desks there. You've only got so many desks that you can sit at. But if I walk into the office in the morning, I can go over to my desk, sit down, and that's where I am. Or I could have an unallocated office set up where there's no personalized things, there's nothing left behind at the end of the day, they're all blank desktops. And first in, first serve. Go to that desk, this desk, that one, that one, and so on down the chain. Now, that second example is what DHCP is in a network. Dynamic Host Control Protocol. Basically means all of them are treated identically and they can move anywhere they want to when it's done that way, roughly speaking. Um, so first in, first serve, they go wherever they want to. They may try to go back to where they were yesterday, but if somebody's already sitting there, then they'll move on to somewhere else. That's simply enough. The other side of it is you can set static internal IP addresses, and that means my desk is my desk. So when I come into the building, it doesn't matter whatever else is going on, I'm going to go over and sit on my desk that's got a photo of my cat and it's got my pens on it or whatever the hell else I put on my desk. And that's setting those static IP addresses. Now, that is a much, much better way to do it for these DVRs. DHCP is easy. Tick in the network settings here, on this. If I go into settings here and I go into my network and I tick that little box for DHCP, then it allows my modem to put it wherever it wants to put it. Okay, so at the moment it's sitting at 192.168.0.238 because there is nothing else there, nothing else around that range that's going to give it problems. But if there was, then I wouldn't see this thing. It would disappear completely. So I need to go in here, turn off DHCP, set an IP address, and then set it in my router as well to tell it this is where you're going. This is your desk. This is your phone. This is your picture. This is whatever you've got at your time. All right. And to do that, I'm going to jump onto the computer and show you some of how that works. Because I've got to get into this thing, the, into the modem or the router itself, to show you how that happens. Um, other stuff on here that I'll just bring up quickly, remote port 5050 and HTTP port 80. Remote port is the port you're going to use for the apps, and uh, HTTP port is generally what you're using locally or for syncing data and other stuff like that. The 3G button at the bottom is a lie. There is no 3G built into this thing. Does that make sense? More or less? Right, and I have one more thing. In here is the dynamic DNS settings as well, which I'm going to do on the computer to show you instead. So, let's jump across from here. So that's sort of my very, very, very basic internal networking guide. You need to give them addresses, you need to tell them where to go, otherwise they will not know what to do. They will not know where to go. So, let's do this. And so this is my TP-Link router. And to get there, I've typed in its, okay, 
let's log out of this thing and I'll show you exactly what that's like. I am connected via wireless network to this thing and has no internet access whatsoever. It's just doing this stuff for today. And I go into my web browser, in this case I'm using Internet Explorer, and I type in the IP address of my router. There's a default one that nobody really changes for most routers. And in this case, it's 192.168.0.1. Sometimes it's written on a panel on the bottom of it. Other times, you might need to go into the manual or look at it online and find out what the default IP address is. Generally speaking, most people don't change it. They just plug it in, connect it to the internet, and off they go. So I go to here, I put in my username and password, which, because I've defaulted this thing, is admin and admin. In my own home, it is not admin and admin, so don't even think you can drive by my house and try to log into my internet later on tonight. Um, and now I'm into the main page for this particular mode of this router. So I've got my wireless settings, including security and everything else in here, and there is my password for today. So if any of you want to connect your phone to this so we can do the app stuff in a minute, connect to TP-Link, whatever it is, and put in password radio parts. All right, so when we're doing the app stuff, that's what you're going to need to do. Um, yes, whatever, and so on and so on and so on. Not setting up guest networks, but here we go. Here's DHCP. So here's a DHCP server. The idea is that between these two ranges, between 0 0.100 and 0 0.199, it's assigning devices those numbers automatically. So anything that connects to this uh, modem or router is trying to look at something in that range. If it's got DHCP turned on here, as well as, as, well as in there. Now, I've got a lease time here, which means that for those 120 minutes, this thing sits on that IP address. At the end of that time, if something comes in and says, no, I want that IP address, then it can change over and onto there. My default gateway is the one that we're already on, and these I'm not really worried about using them that much. Now, one other thing I want to show you is how to find this stuff, some of this stuff out if you've never done it before. To do that, I'm going to just do this. Right, so this is my normal desktop here. You can see over the bottom here, I'm connected just to this modem at the moment. And I've got no internet access. If I go to start, and I search for CMD, Right, so here's CMD, it's a command window for those of you with DOS, um, DOS old boys, it's a pretty easy way to do it. If you type this in, I'll produce some notes that have got this stuff in it that makes a bit more sense than you try to scribble it down, but it's called IP config. I've been using this since the early 90s when it started coming out to try and do this sort of networking stuff. And it was bad then and it hasn't really changed much, but what it shows me in here this is the IP address, IPv4 address, for my computer. So this device that's running this program says, I am here. And you can see that's 192.168.0.101, which is in that range that we're looking at there. All right. And I look at here, and it says, there is my default gateway address, 192.168.0.1, or the one that I'm connected to. So if I can't work out what I think my TP-Link's IP address is, I can do this thing and find it. It takes 10 seconds. And then all you do is type that address into the bar up there, and then you can log in and do what you need to do for it. It's a really neat little tool. I've been using it for ages, and it works well. Um, all right, so that's DHCP. And so here we go. We've got somebody on there on an Android device. I'm assuming that might be, let me see, would that be Damien that's connected to it? No? Not sure. Somebody's connected to here on an Android device. There's my laptop. There's my phone, you can see it's on 100, there's 101, there's 102, and this one is my DVR that I've given a permanent IP address to. And this means that I can't ever get any of these things interfering with this one. This one has been set at that address. That's the one that I set up before, it's the one you saw on the device. Doing it this way is a great idea. On here, it's going to address reservation, and I can go in here and say, this MAC address is this. And I can add a new one in just by putting a MAC address and putting an IP address in that they want to do. And so for MAC addresses, I'll show you how to get those. 
can do that. 192.168.0.238. Remember, that was the address for my DVR. If I type that into Internet Explorer, bang, I bring up this web page. This is the login page for my DVR. I need to allow it to do its thing. Let's see it's doing something at the top here. It says it blocked it. I don't want to block it. I want to install it. This will happen unless you set it to not do it. Install. This will take about 15 seconds. Yes. Call it this. So this is installing an ActiveX control that allows you to actually view this thing and control it and do all the other stuff that you need to do. If you don't install it, you cannot use it. And it means that Chrome and Firefox and so on do not work with this. Internet Explorer is the one you need to work with. You can see now I'm back on this page. If I refresh it, beautiful. No warnings, no nothing comes up. My username, admin, password, nothing. Submit, jump in, and there we are. I'm now into my NVR. So over on this side, I've got this red highlighted. I can tap this and bring up camera number two. And tap it to turn it off and bring up camera one. Easy enough. I'll do that there. I can go here, select this one. I can turn that on and bang. I've got both my IP cameras up and viewing. Simple. But that's not the coolest thing you can do with this interface. The coolest thing you can do with this interface is here. Go to config. This is all the setup. The same menus that I went through before, but on your computer. So you can actually type in the stuff you want to type. If you have a password that's 14 characters long, doing that with a mouse is a painful thing. Doing it with the remote control is slip your wrists kind of painful thing. Doing it with a keyboard here makes it very, very simple. I can get in here, I can change my system info, I can go to my channel parameters, I can go to my motion detection and do all the same stuff I was doing before through here instead. And this is a much easier interface, I find, to do that than trying to do it on the DVR itself. So, my biggest hope for all of you, take a laptop or a computer, a desktop, big box with a screen and keyboard, everything with you every time you do a DVR job or an NVR job, it will make your life so much easier. Um, this is the web interface. I'm going to show you how to do it with a bit of software as well. I have one more option for it. Um, but I mentioned the MAC address. So back over here, if I wanted to add in a new MAC, a new address, an IP address, I go to here, I go to my network settings, and I can see right here, control it, it is my MAC address for this unit. That is a unique identifier. Everything with a network thing in it, from your phones to tablets to DVRs to IP cameras and so on, all has their own unique MAC address. In this case, it's that. And if I go across to here, and I go back to my clients list where I had them, you'll notice that top device there, that equals that. So I put that MAC address into my address reservation. And so that MAC address and that reserved address are always going to be there. They're going to be the same. I've also added two more in here. These are for the IP cameras themselves. Don't have to, but I'm going to in this case because that means there's less likely something's going to break it later on. And you'll notice I've chosen addresses here that are well and truly out of the range that my normal DHCP stuff is sitting in. So it doesn't have to, but I could put them um, in the same area if I wanted to. I just tend to keep them all separate so I know that all my Net all my standard network stuff is here, my DVR's up there, and off it goes. Um, let's say, so, I'm going to exit this thing for now, and I'm going to show you, if I go to 192.168.0.239, uh, I think is the one I want. Okay, and I've got to do the same thing again here. I deliberately didn't install these beforehand because I wanted you to see that you will have to do this the first time as well. Um, it's yeah, it slows down the demonstration, but it means that it, it's something that I'm showing you that you will have to do. So, install. Give it a space. Come on. And the idea being. 
Peggy, can you? And yeah, I'm just going to put dash two at the end of this one again to keep it different from what I was playing with already. Install. And done. So now I'm on that page. I tend to get refresh after every time I do something like that, just to make sure it's actually installed. Because if you refresh and it comes up with a pop up again, then you haven't installed it, it hasn't worked, and you can go again for it. So now submit. I jump in here, and guess what? That looks pretty similar, except it's only got one channel up. And the reason for that is this is just that camera. I've logged directly into that one IP camera. Something you can do with IP cameras you can't do with normal ones. What that means for you is the config page for here is all the settings for this camera. So remember WDR, remember your game controls and contrast and everything else like that. That is all in here. So I go into my channel parameters, my display settings, and look, I can set an internal camera time, I can set all my brightness and contrast. And my video settings page. I can go in here and I can set the type of encoder that we're using. I can set my bit rate. I can do all these other bits and pieces for it here. My video parameters, I can set, here it is, wide dynamic, it's set to high. Right? It's not a little dial or a little thing on the camera itself, it's in the software. The only place to get into it is either through this or through the video management software that I'll show you right now. Okay, so just keep that in mind when you're doing IP stuff as well. You also need to log into the cameras to give them, tweak them the way you want to. It also means that if you plug these things in for the first time and they're not found by your DVR or your NVR, for whatever reason, something goes wrong with the search, the network's set up weirdly, whatever else happens, you can log directly into the camera and you can manually change its IP address or you can set it to DHCP or whatever else you use you want to do there. So if it hasn't found it, log in here and change it. So if I wanted to change this back to its default, so that I can put it back into stock and sell it to one of you afterwards, I can do all that through here. All right? That makes sense? And I'm sort of running through this fast, but it's something you've almost got to get your hands on and do for yourself the first time. But this is the, the idea of what's going on. Um, and I've also got ports here that I can forward this camera on its own to your apps to be able to view them too. All right? So let's get out of this one. Uh, one thing, you can't run multiple windows uh, of uh, cameras running simultaneously because they're all trying to use the same sort of ActiveX controls and they tend to fail. One of them won't log in, one of the windows will crash, whatever happens. So just one camera at once or one DVR or NVR at once, please. Right, so that's that software program. Let's do the video monitor software. Alright, so this is software you can download from our website. This is our website, this is for the 4-channel DVR, it's the same for the NVRs. You go to the download section that's there, there's the video monitor software. The current version is from June last year and it works perfectly well, apart from one bug, which I will show you. They are apparently fixing it. So, here it is, username and password, well nothing at the moment. Log in and bang, here's my interface. Now, what I'm going to do is actually delete all of these because I'm showing them to the gym guys earlier and I want to do this raw for you. Let's do that. So this is what you will see. It says CMS over here. You can right click on here, add a device. If you know your device IP address, you can put it manually into there. Great. Or you can do what I do and do the lazy way and search. Fantastic. You'll see that I've also plugged in the analog DVR to it. So if I have a look here, here are my Goolink ID numbers, GID numbers. There's my device type. So I've got a DVR, the analog, NVR, the digital, and I've got two IP cameras as well. I've got all the ports that they're using and their device names, the usernames and passwords. Select them all and I batch add them. It takes a minute, then they all come through here and you can see all the red crosses will go away. And there we go, there's my DVR, my NVR, and there's the cameras themselves. If I go over to preview, I go to NVR, I go to channel 2, double click. There is my channel 2 for my NVR, I'm viewing that through here. Now if I go up here and go to my DVR, go to channel 1, now I'm looking at the analog one alongside the digital one at the same time. And I can put this one anywhere I want it to be put. 
and that means on a big network with multiple DVRs or MDRs, you can have any camera option and configuration you possibly want. There is a variety of different views. So if you've got stacks of these things on your network, you can have all of your cameras up and active simultaneously. Although I suspect it may cause you some network issues with data. Um, most common way is probably to listen to that. There we go. Isn't that exciting? But it's a very useful feature for one last thing as well. In that, if I go over to configuration here, and I've got my devices. If I go, this is my IP camera that I was looking at a minute ago. If I go to remote config, guess what? I've got full access to all its controls like I did before. So if I want to go into my channel parameters, change my video configuration to play with my you know, format or frame rate or whatever else is going on in there, I can do all that through this software too. It means you don't have to mess around with Internet Explorer. You don't have to log directly into the device itself. You don't have to use the remote control or the mouse or anything else. You can do it all through the software. Complete setup is done through your computer. And that I encourage all of you to do. It is much, much easier. It's a quick, easy download, installs fine and works well. You also use that software to remotely access that? Uh, you can, but it is more complicated. Um, because you need to do some port forwarding and other network setup, which is the bit I was about to try and finish with. All right. Um, okay. Is there any interface with dynamic DNS with this, using dynamic DNS? You can do this through dynamic DNS as well, okay. if you like. You've so you can remote in. in port addresses and things yeah, like right. that. So where we went to here and added a device before, you can put in you know, a device IP that is, you know, radio parts, you know, static IP address, or it can be a dynamic DNS or a no IP address or whatever in there, port number that you're using for it, username and password and so on, log in through there as well, and to remote in for it. Um, but we haven't done remote accessing in here yet, so. Um, right, so that's this bit of software. Um, there is one thing which is irritating for me. Um, if you close this down using the big red cross up in the top right hand corner, like you always do. Okay, fine. Now I want to run that bit of software again. Actually, I hit the wrong one. That's the, that's the old program. This is going to work, but it shouldn't. Um, let's do. So, video monitor software is the new stuff. Yes, yeah, that. Right, if I go to video monitor software now, bang, I get an error coming up. What do you mean a remote run? I'm running it. It's, you can't run it once a day. You know, it, it, you can run it as many times as you want to. What that means is it's still running in the system software in the background. It doesn't shut down properly for whatever reason. There's something bad about the code there. Right click on the top on the. Bar, go to your task manager, go down, and look, there's a video monitor software still using 125 megabytes of uh, memory. I'm going to kill that. And if I go back to video monitor software, bang, she works again. There's something weird about the way it shuts down. If that comes up, control alt delete, go to your task manager find it in the list, delete it, and then you can start and run again. Or, you can do like most of my customers do, and minimize it rather than actually closing it. Just run it in the background all the time. That's one fix. Um, it is something that the factory is working on, along with you know, other things and other features and other bugs and other places. But that's the biggest one you're likely to come across, so I wanted to point that out to you as well. Okay. Right, last thing. Last thing, because I've run well and truly over. All right, port forwarding and dynamic DNS and all that sort of stuff. This is a long discussion I'm going to have time for. Number one, use our remote access service. Suzanne, the guy who runs it, is brilliant and well worth your time. Um, RM access on our website, buy the service, get it sorted out. It's very, very easy to work through and do it. You can do it for your funds. If you want to do it for yourself. OK, so I'm in my browser here. Here's my forwarding page. I've got port triggering for whatever reason it's called on here. I need to add a device to allow any incoming ports on uh, any calls on that number to go through to that number. 
and off it goes from there. The idea of it with ports is they are holes in your internet connection to the outside world. Port 80 is generally open that's used for web browsing. So when you're when you type in google.com.au in your browser, it goes through port 80 most of the time to do its stuff. These ones are generally closed. So if I try to access it from outside through there, you wouldn't get it. It means you've got access to it forevermore. Um, and you can add these in as virtual servers on this one as well. So you add in an IP address and a service port and all sorts of things from here. But it is different in every single router, so I'm not going to tell you how to do it specifically for this one. Because the TP-Link one that I use here is different from some other generations of TP-Link one. It's different from the Netcoms, Netgears, D-Links, NAS, uh, yeah, Cisco's, Ubiquities, everything else that comes along. To do this sort of stuff, practice it first. Play with it on your own home router at home. Try and get it forwarded and work it through there perfectly. It works really, really well. There's one more way to, well, actually, there are two more ways to do it, and that involves the app. So let me jump across to my phone. So I've got my iPhone set up and organized on here. Here are my notes for today's session. Get out of this. So I go into my CCTV apps and let's go to Google Link. This is the primary app that we use for this service. Um, Google Link, when I'm running internally here, allows me to add a device and view it anytime I want to. If I can see here across the bottom, these things are blue flashing, it means that something's happening on them at the moment, and they're actually the two devices I've set up today. So I can bring up my test NVR, connect to this, and now I'm watching channel one on the NVR through my phone. And you can see why am I holding this up, it's big again. Um, there's the camera view up on the screen. I can go to my second window and put up camera number two as well. It's obviously dependent on your wireless speed and things like that for it. That's easy. But I'm going to delete that one and show you exactly how to do it. So, there's my test in the uh, edit. Uh, that's right. Turn that. Turn off. Turn off. Right. Now I'm going to get in here. Edit. Delete. Cool. So, here's my main page for Google again. There's a <laughs> right. I've got a push button, a little plus icon. I've got three options. I can do a QR code, I can do a manual, local search, or I can cancel it. If I do, okay, let's do a local search. So I'm on Wi-Fi, the same network as this thing, and bang, there are my, well, there are three devices that pop up. And it could be any one of those three addresses is the device that I want. On your typical networks, there will be one that comes up. That's the one you want to do. In this case, my NVR is the second one. I know that because I looked at the settings earlier on. Put my name in here, tests, NVR, put my username, no password, and done. Goes back to there, and there's my test NVR. If I tap on it, hopefully, there we go. There we are. That's a local search. That's the easiest way to get this thing running locally. So while you're on Wi-Fi, while you're on site, that works perfectly well. Um, if you're trying to run it remotely, the QR code, the local search, and the rest of it, all of this is bounced through the Google Link um, access servers. So it's what's called the universal plug and play, which means it creates its own rules through your web ports stream the data off-site and then back down to a phone. So you don't have to do the port forwarding or anything else like that. It is a quick and easy setup option for it. However, there's one link in that chain you've got to be careful of. It's reliant on your modem or router allowing you to do UPnP, which not all of them do. You may have to turn it on. And you're reliant on the Google Link servers setting your information up and being able to bounce it back to you when you want it to. Okay? You're relying on that third-party service to do it, and that's great. They've been fantastic for us so far. The responses have been fast and reliable and all those sorts of things. They work well. However, that will not always be the case. There can be things that go wrong with it. If something changes, something happens, the service goes down, then you're stuck going back to doing it the old-fashioned way instead, which is port forwarding and so on. Now, there's one little trick with port forwarding and the other app. So Google Link works for this universal plug and play stuff, local search, no problem. The other way to do it is through the other app called MI. 
So here's my MI interface. My home button up the top, go to my device list there. Now I've already set this one up, but let's have a look at it. So device four. So it's the same IP address. That is the tricky bit right there. Remember as we were going through, we said port 5050 was what we were looking at. That's not port 5050, unless my maths has really failed me. The way these things work is they use multiple ports to send all the information through. There might be configuration data on one port, there might be video data on another, there could be something else on another one. In this case, this uses port 5053. If I was using 8000 on there, it would be 8003. If it was 2045, it would be 2048 that we're using. If you understand, like it's the number plus three. That's it. So if you've got 5050, put 5053 in, save this, go back to here, and I go to this device, I choose here, I choose channel one, and bang, there's my, um, there's my camera that I was looking at before. That is a little trick. It is on our website. It's in small text. I want it bigger. It will be bigger, but keep it in mind. When you're doing it this way, I'm running it locally again. MI will not work remotely unless you do the port forwarding. All right? You have to go through and do the port forwarding on your modem and router to make this happen. Okay? Googling doesn't need it, but it relies on a third party service. This thing relies on you doing all the setup yourself through your home router. And that leads me to the last thing, really last thing this time. Um, external IP addresses and dynamic DNS. Your, my, our network here, we've paid for and got a static IP address that is always the same. Doesn't matter what they do with us, we're always going to have that same IP address. If they were going to change it, it would be a huge hassle for us. So we've paid for that service. People can pay for it for themselves, for their businesses as well. I think it's about $10 a month. Don't quote me on that because it changes from ISP to ISP, but some will not allow it at all. If you set up a static IP address for your home, all I need to do is go in here. So here's my local, one of our local DVRs on this IP address. That's my internal one. Here is the same thing on an external IP address. And I've got two different ways of connecting to this thing. When I'm inside, I use that. When I'm outside, I use that. And it uses my mobile data. It goes straight to the modem here goes into the, through the network and talks to the DVR and then sends me the video I want. That is a direct link. Uh, that's a fantastic way to do it. Um, it's my preferred method for it, but I'm a nerd. I like full control over my network and all my settings. So that might be important to you as well. Depends on your network, depends on your customer. Depends on the router, depends on the modem and all those sort of things for it. And the alternative to doing this is if I went into here, you can also use a noip or dynamic dns service in there as well so you sign up through noip.com and they'll give you an address a port number you'll update them tell them what your ip address is today and it keeps it updated and doing its thing um, that's more complicated i'll talk to anybody who wants to talk to me about it afterwards and again it varies a lot on your computers and networks and so on but if they don't want to buy a static ip address then they've got that option if you do it for free you get what you pay for which means you've got to update them all the time and tell them what's going on. If it fails for any length of time, because of something you've done, they've got no responsibility to fix it. You haven't paid them a cent. So be very careful with it. And it can, again, it's a third party service that can go down. All right. Cool, I've talked myself hoarse and I've been here a lot longer than I should have been. So um, I'll take any questions and anything else afterwards, um, but we've got a second session to get through as well, I'm afraid. So. I hope that's been of some use. Hope it's helpful. Thank you. Very useful. Thank you.